Is suffering necessary until it isn't? Giselle Taraba finds this quote from Eckhart Tolle to be really useful in helping her to come to terms with the second noble truth. Hi, it's Margaret Maloney and welcome to the Death Dhamma Podcast. I'm a Buddhist practitioner out here in the world, having experienced the loss of my loved ones and knowing how much my Buddhist practice helped me on my grief journey. And now together we have this safe space to discuss death, dying, grief, and the Buddhist teachings that help us really understand attachment, impermanence, being compassionate, being death ready, what it means to live a life so that we can have a peaceful death. Yep, it's a big topic and we're gonna take it on together. Let's go. Suppose you are in a boat and you're rowing and you're on a lake and you see someone who is drowning in the water, they can choose to get in the boat or not. But sometimes what we do is we jump into the water with them. Then we suffer too. We might drown. But what if you stay on the boat and hold out your hand? They can take your hand or not. This is compassion without being overwhelmed by the difficulty of their situation. Welcome my friends to another episode of the Death Dhamma podcast. And today, join me in welcoming Giselle Taraba from the Love and Compassion podcast. So right away, you can see why she I'm so happy that she would spend time with us today because she's a perfect fit. And on her podcast, she shares extraordinary stories of love and compassion. So that helps with our suffering right away, right? Because we always know that some good self-compassion is going to go a long way. Also compassion to others. She is also the author of Reimagining Work from Suffering at Work to creating a more loving, compassionate, abundant, and spiritually aligned life. And we spend a lot of time working and the way that we behave impacts ourselves and it impacts others. And in my other life where I teach project management, which is all about work, I like to say, can we please use our powers for good? And so, you know, she is helping us with suffering in the workplace. And I think you have some other work that you do. So I'm going to let you take it from there. So welcome, Giselle. And please feel free to tell us a little bit more about yourself and your work. Uh, Thank you very much uh, for having me on your show. I appreciate it. Um, Yes, definitely. Um, You mentioned uh, my book. I I actually left uh, a high paying, very stressful job to do the work that I'm doing now, because when I was in leadership, it was all about relationship management Mm -hmm. and how do we, how much suffering there was at work um, and how um, I really felt that compassion could have really helped us, but I wasn't really able to get it on traction there. Um, And so I left to do my own work. Uh, So yeah, so there, um, I currently am writing my second book, uh, reimagining education. <laughs> oh. I don't know what's going on at UCLA, but um, there's definitely, an, a, from my perspective, a need to shift our perspective and how we teach young people. Um, there's definitely be all the technology um, and everything that's happening. I think a lot more of the teaching needs to focus on the inner work, mm-hmm. emotional regulation, uh, the need for mindfulness, the need for self-compassion, the need for improved relationships. Um, and then everything kind of goes from there. Um, so mm-hmm. that's really the next sort of project that I'm currently taking on. As you mentioned, I have my podcast um, and I, I offer that as a resource on my website. Um, I recently did a TEDx talk that I'm waiting for it to come out. And it was about uh, the interviews I had done um, during the years with some people that have done extraordinary acts of compassion, Mm -hmm. um, how they were able to alchemize the worst of suffering into sort of like the gifts they brought in those moments. Um, And so I'm looking forward to that coming out. Oh, as am I. And I hope that when your book is ready and your TEDx talk is ready, that you will circle back to me and let me know, because I'm definitely going to want to share that. And, you know, in education, yes. And with uh, how we teach and maybe even how faculty and the system treats one another. I spent part of a day this last weekend with a friend who's I'll say deep into academia. I'm kind of on the peripheral edges, which is beautiful. And she's deep into the system and, and she was sharing some things 
And I remember I finally just looked at her. I said, this sounds really awful. And then I think she felt like she had to console me. And she's like, no, I, I do love my job. I'm like, okay. But it, yeah. So there's some harsh things going on. Definitely. Yeah. And I, what I've noticed in one of the things I talk about in my book, Reimagining Work, is how we have these systems of a hierarchy and power over. And that's sort of what we've been taught and what we've agreed to. And so now we're seeing a shift that that kind of leadership and that kind of structure really doesn't work. Uh, it really doesn't. Um, that's not what people are looking for. They're no longer wanting to do that. And so the perspective has really shifted. And how can we shift that to develop a system or systems that really work for everyone? It doesn't have to be this or that. It can be this and that. Um, and so it's about really shifting our perspective and really weaving love and compassion within these systems to really create, to really ameliorate the suffering. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. let's start with a basic. We're going to come back to most of what you said, because I want to know more, of course, but I'm going to start with just a basic, which is the noble truth of suffering. And, and this yeah. isn't, I say this to everyone, just so you know, it's not meant to be a trick question. We all in our different traditions and practices might express it a little differently. And therefore we might carry it out a little bit differently. And so I just would like to know your perspective when you think of the noble truth of suffering. Express it yeah, to I, you know, when I think about suffering, I think about the quote from Eckhart Tolle, which is uh, suffering is necessary until you realize it is unnecessary. Um, and what I mean by that is, um, so I learned a lot from my suffering. Well, first of all, I had to realize I was suffering and that it was me that was causing myself suffering. Okay. That didn't mean that I didn't experience pain. People hurt me. Um, but I continue to re-traumatize and cause myself suffering by the thoughts and the feelings I continue to have. And so I had to realize how suffering was, how I was contributing to my suffering. Mm-hmm. Um, and what I could learn from it, it taught me also to be compassionate and, and kind and to observe other people's suffering as well. Um, but then I realized along the way that at some point that I didn't have to live a, 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 a life of suffering. I didn't have to suffer. I could um, keep myself, and I, I use this boat analogy, um, which if you don't mind, I, I, I will share it. Oh, um, I want to hear it. Yeah. And it's it's a way that reminds me to, to not focus on the suffering. So suppose that you're on a boat and you're rowing on a lake and you see somebody drowning. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, you as a human being obviously would want to extend your hand out and say, hey, get on the boat. I, I, I hope you're doing OK. Um, and the person can choose or not choose to get on your boat. For me, that's compassion. Oh. But people, what they do is they jump in the water to try to save the person, and then they end up potentially drowning themselves. That's the, kind of the empathetic distress or sympathy where people kind of, you know, have you ever felt like really sad about somebody, like somebody has a really difficult story and you suffer with them? Yes. All you're doing is really just contributing more suffering to the issue. And so what I like to do is I remind myself to stay on the boat and extend my hand. The person can choose to not to take my hand or to choose to take it. That's their choice. But I don't have to go into the water with them. I can continue to hold out my hand until they choose to, to take it. That is so a that's helpful like, analogy. Thank you so much because you're right. So yes, I can jump in and you're right. I think so much, sometimes, so many times we do that uh, figuratively and, you know, and otherwise, and we just jump in. And then, like you said, we are also potentially drowning because now yeah. we are surrounded by the difficulty and the sadness. And you can stay in your boat, and that doesn't make you uncaring. It makes you coming from a it makes you come from a place of strength. You know, and what I, I tend to think of compassion as, you know, noticing the suffering of others, understanding that they are suffering and wanting to help them. So I can be in my boat, notice and want to help them but I don't have to put myself at risk of drowning, which I guess I would say in, in a way that's equanimity entering the equation as well. Yeah, for sure. And I, I also take, um, I have to acknowledge a spiritual perspective on, on this. Mm -hmm. um, I like to believe that we are all just really these powerful beings and that everybody has the potential to change at any moment. So sometimes the best thing it and most loving thing I can do to someone mm -hmm. is just hold that vision of them that they are, they, they can overcome, that they are powerful, that they are successful, that they, to see them as they would want to see themselves. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's the only thing that they're willing to accept. And that's okay. 
I have to be able to allow people to make their own mistakes and to learn their own lessons without perceiving that I may know better. And so for me, it really is about allowing things to be, Mm -hmm. obviously being that beacon and support for people that want to take that help, but not pushing my help or support for people because I observe them suffering. And I actually learned that from a person experiencing homelessness. Okay. We were talking about, we were talking about, um, you know, um, I would see this person as I was going to a class I was attending. And I remember one time I just sat down and we were chatting mm-hmm. and I asked what sort of the most challenging aspect of homelessness was. And I was surprised by his answer because he said the people that were trying to help him. And I was like, okay, what do you mean? And what he said to me was that, you know, he would see some regular people that would donate money. And then over time, those people would get really angry with him. And sometimes we'd get very verbal with him because they're like, well, you know, we give you money. Why aren't you helping yourself? And, you know, and and so it was that, that helping with expectation, the helping with the, with the, well, you have to help yourself and it has to look this way. This person was homeless by choice, did okay. not want to participate in the systems, did not want to, I uh, didn't like the structure of the society we were living in. And so, you know, obviously there was serious downsides to, home, to the homelessness he was experiencing. Mm-hmm. But one of the things that he felt strongly about was his right to choose. Mm-hmm. And so, so I was very surprised um, at his answer. I would have said it was, you know, a potential violence and, you know, in, in the shelters and so on and so forth but right it was that so I remember reflecting on that conversation and asking myself where am I giving with judgment where am I expecting people to change uh, in my life mm-hmm. and where can I practice more of an unconditional love and acceptance and I find that when I do that people are much more receptive to my help than when they feel judged for uh for the, the support I can see what you're saying as you're speaking. I'm thinking that definitely something I've worked on in my life is letting go of that expectation of helping uh, and maybe more so in my you know personal relationships than with helping someone on the street. But definitely that thought of I did this for you, with you, whatever. And now I can't believe you're treating me this way. Or yeah, definitely early on, I had strings attached. I didn't realize I had strings attached until there was a problem. And then I was like, wow, how could this person treat me this way? I helped pay for their kid's tuition or whatever. And I had to really look at myself, which is important and difficult (laughs) and realize your role. What is your role in this, Margaret? Your role is you are not giving without strings attached. You think there's no strings attached, but those strings, they came right up. They came right up. That's very insightful of you. Um, So I think you should acknowledge that Uh, because often there's so many of us and there's been times in my life when I wasn't even willing to have a conversation. I wasn't really wanting to be that aware. And so anytime there is that level of awareness where we're saying, okay, what's my responsibility? I think is is something that should be acknowledged um, because it's such a strong stepping stone to us making a change. Um, Whenever there's expectation, there's always going to be suffering. Mm-hmm. Because, because sometimes our expectations are, are are not met or not vocalized. I wasn't very good at in my relationships in the past at being able to say what I really needed. I expected the person to be a mind reader <laughs> to right, tell me right. you should know if you knew me, then you would know this. Right. And that's kind of a very unfair expectation. Um, and so expectations usually lead to suffering. I had to learn that one too. I had to learn that one too. I had to realize sometimes you just have to look at people and say, no, this is what I really want. And then deal with it together, right? But that not knowing, like, how can somebody read my mind and know that today I want to go have pizza or whatever the thing is, you know, like, well, you should just know I like to have pizza on Fridays. Really? Why should they just know that? For me, I realized that it was about wanting to be seen. For me, when I really dug into those expectations, it was about, does this person really see me? But then, like you said, you know, I had to really dig a little deeper and say, am I allowing myself to be fully seen? And I wasn't. Right. I went around with this armor on, but I wasn't aware I had an armor on. And Mm -hmm. so my husband once said to me when we were dating, 
So when are you going to put your armor down? <laughs> yes. And Dang. I was like, yikes. <laughs> and I'm like, what armor? And he's like, oh, you carry around a pretty thick armor. But when you're in it, you don't really realize that you're walking around. So I really wasn't allowing people to see me. And so therefore, people couldn't really know how to meet those expectations. So I was setting up sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy where people disappointed me. Yeah, and it's it's heavy. We get this armor and it's heavy, but we get used to the weight. Yeah, I love that you said that. Yeah. We get used to the weight. True. Can you share with us, you know, you've had these experiences, you had this experience with the unhoused person, you've had your own challenges. So what brought you to this place of taking your experience and wanting to help others to get rid of their suffering or to make suffering easier for them? What brought you to this place where you decided that's what you were going to do? Um, I think that has morphed over time, but I'll start with the beginning. I think in the beginning, I was just wanting to help myself. And I I kind of have this belief that when you help others, you help yourself Mm -hmm. um, because we're so interconnected. So I really felt like the way that I could help myself was by helping others. And then I find that you also learn from when you're helping others. Um, But now I feel like it just comes from a genuine love of people. It doesn't come from that place of suffering or needing to to teach and learn anymore. It comes from just a genuine love of how amazing and wonderful we are um, and how much fun it is to watch people flourish. Um, And I still do believe in that interconnectedness. You know, my wellness depends on your wellness. As a friend of mine said, I can't be well unless you are well because, you know, you hurt someone else and then they hurt someone else and it eventually comes back to me. And so it is very much, as she said, an act of self-love to love others. Uh, So for me, um, it really is about loving myself through others. Okay. Through being of service. Okay. And, you know, your, I would say one of your primary tools or messages, however you want to say it, is to really bring compassion and Maybe you can share with us some of the ways in which you are helping people bring compassion into their work lives to really, you know, make it a better, a better experience and more spiritual alignment in the, uh, in the day-to-day, you know, work that pays our bills. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Um, so the, the primary thing is that really is that awareness of what we're feeling in the moment Mm -hmm. and what we need in the moment. So often when we're in the workplace, we're just go, go, go. And we're not taking time to check in. Uh, But at one point I I had the role of being a director of like, I think I had nine departments at some point or maybe even 11. And one of my departments was HR. And leadership is all about interpersonal. It's all about relationship management. And I would see these people that were so hurt at times and didn't know how to manage those difficult feelings because they hadn't taken the time out to check in with themselves and ask themselves what they needed in that moment and given it to themselves through compassion, through love, or even externally if they needed to reach out to someone else. And so that's one of the ways that I am helping people is through helping them understand that they can tap into this well within themselves of loving compassion that exists there naturally they don't need to take things from other people and cause us kind of relationship issues they always have this unlimited well within themselves and by tapping into that well they can fill up their own cups and they can give to other people from their overflow Um, and so that's one of the ways the other part where giving ourselves what we need in the moment is really helpful is in having difficult conversations Again, in the workplace, there's a difficult conversations have to happen mm-hmm. unless you are not doing any any of the work or unless you're not diverse enough. You have to have difficult conversations, whether it be with students or with your fellow faculty or with leadership. And so it's about managing our own emotions and our own needs in that moment so that then we can be open to differing perspectives, perspectives that otherwise would trigger us and cause us to eject or get defensive. And so by leaning into our own difficult feelings, we can stay in the conversation longer with one another. And then we can get at that, finding that commonality, finding that understanding, getting into curiosity. But until we manage our difficult feelings, 
we're not going to get there. And this is what you're seeing in the world now, which is people canceling one another. There isn't a, 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 an, an opportunity for real conversation, even difficult conversations about race and equity and all of these other issues. I get that. I get that. Okay. And, and, you know, there's research that has been conducted absolutely about the value of compassion in the workplace and how it, you know, helps with anxiety and stress and builds stronger teams. And that uh, in situations where team members have offered other one another compassion, they generally will stay longer, they will work harder, they will become that, you know, productive team. And, you know, so for people who want to know, I'll say, you know, the business case for this, like, because sometimes I like, I come at it from a place of we should just treat each other well, like we should all get this. Uh, but we are talking about the, the work world. And so sometimes people want to know like the bottom line, right? So here's the bottom line is your team can become a high performing team. They'll be more productive. They'll do better. You'll do better. But still, I have to think that you encounter that person that's like, but Giselle, I'm a director. I can't, it goes back to the armor discussion we just had. I can't show them any cracks in my armor. If I show people compassion, they're going to think I'm weak. Help me. Yeah, we have a lot of myths of compassion. And, and it's, it's so thank you for asking this question. There is that perspective. First of all, I don't think we understand what leadership is or, or what leaders, what it, what it means to lead someone. Um, and we certainly don't understand the difference between true strength and versus force, right? Uh -huh. um, and so people think that using force or power over is the way that we get people to change. But the truth of the matter is the most effective way to get people to change is through motivation and understanding and mutual, um, mutual collaboration. And so there is this perspective that, you know, compassion and love are weak and that, you know, if I do that, then people are going to walk all over me. But that's actually not been found in the research. So thank you for mentioning the research. The research hasn't just found that at all. It has found that actually, like you said, it creates more cohesive teams. People come together more. Um, and it even results in, in better economic outcomes uh, for the organization because people actually want to work there. They don't want to. They, they feel a passion. They feel a loyalty for the, um, for the team. And I will also say that Giving yourself and others compassion when you don't think either yourself or the other person deserves it is one of the hardest things to do. Mm. It is one of the most challenging things to do. People think it's weak. It's the other way around. I've spoken to people who have forgiven people that murdered their children. I've spoken to people who have faced sexual assault and had to, mm -hmm. to forgive and find compassion for that. That is the hardest thing that you could do. It is so much easier to just put power over and put our armor on. Mm -hmm. It's much, much more difficult to allow ourselves to be vulnerable. But that's where true connection comes. And when you're working within a team that has true connection, they're unstoppable. That's true. I think that's true. Yes, I do often think, you know, sometimes I want to say to people, like, you don't make the mistake of thinking that compassion is weakness because it's not. And it doesn't make you a doormat. It doesn't make me a doormat. Uh, sometimes compassion means saying no, you know, which brings back to that idea of like, but what if everyone thinks I'm too nice? If I'm compassionate to my team, am I too nice? Yeah. So there's, so I don't think it, I think again, is that people really don't understand what compassion is. So saying no to someone else is saying yes to yourself, mm -hmm. right? Sometimes the most loving and compassionate thing you can do for yourself is to say no to someone else or get away from them or not allow them to hurt you anymore. You know, Kristen Neff has this thing called fierce compassion, which is really about you having really, really strong boundaries and really, you know, stepping in your into your strength. So the most loving and compassionate thing you can do is really have good boundaries. Um, and so, but people don't really understand that they think that giving to others when they don't want to is compassionate. That's not compassion. That's not true compassion because compassion is about yourself and someone else giving to people when you don't feel like you're going to take away from someone, including yourself. Mm -hmm. So to truly practice compassion, you're giving yourself and someone else that. And so it's 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 a gift of love to say to no to someone and to say, I can't do this for you in this moment. I'm sorry, but maybe here's what I can offer or maybe someone else can offer that to you. Okay. 
Okay. Um, what do you see? So with the work that you're doing and where you're helping people and you're bringing compassion, what is the most common suffering that you encounter? So you go to uh, work, consult, mentor, coach somebody, and you're doing this over and over again. So there's some common themes. And maybe you can tell us about what are those common themes, the most common types of suffering that you're seeing come to you in your work. I would say the most common is uh, the negative self-talk, the inner critic, the the harshness, the inner, because I think everybody makes mistakes, but it, mm-hmm. it is how you manage yourself in, in those difficult moments uh, that causes the most suffering because really being harsh and in, in critical to yourself prevents you from changing. And that may seem counterintuitive because we've been taught, oh, you know, my inner critic is my motivator. That's just how I motivate to do work better and better and better. But the truth of the matter is that that inner critic causes a lot of shame and it's shame we don't want to address. And so there will be aspects of ourselves where we will kind of dim our own light and not really truly flourish and be our best selves, our more, most authentic selves. And so can't ever really get to the point of flourishing and getting beyond suffering if you're treating yourself that way. And, and the other thing that I really see is often that people are, are continuing to re-traumatize themselves. Sometimes a trauma happens, mm-hmm. but with their thoughts and emotions, they keep reliving it and reliving it and carrying the same feelings and beliefs and emotions to the next day and the next day and the next day and the next day. And so by not being willing to look at those thoughts and feelings and to make a different choice, they're continuing to um, add to their trauma and continuing to hurt themselves way beyond the experience that they might have had. Mm -hmm. Um, And so inviting people to look at that with curiosity and non-judgment is really something that I I find gets people on their way to um, effectively changing their lives. You know, what's interesting is in this season where I've been talking to different people about, you know, suffering and ways in which we suffer and the way we cause suffering to ourselves. You're not the first person to t- say that some of it comes from within with our self-talk and our negative beliefs and our shame. And so uh, I guess that's part of the common theme of humanity. So I was going to say, I think that's what I had to realize and acknowledge to myself, right? Um mm-hmm. That it was me who was re-traumatizing myself by thinking that I wasn't worthy, by thinking that I was not lovable, by, by you know, um, having all these fears, mm-hmm. allowing these fears to dictate my life and seeing myself as a victim. I really wasn't allowing myself to step into my full power. And I kept giving my power away to other people to determine how I felt about my life and about myself. And so when I took that power back and decided... I don't need to have this relationship with suffering. I don't need to have this relationship with my mind and with my heart. Like things really begin to shift. It's that uh, double pronged arrow, this concept of the suffering, you know, the first shot, first prong, uh, you don't have any control over. It comes and it hits you, but it's how we react that causes ourselves additional pain. And, And in a way you're, you're elaborating on that, that, that concept. You've been doing this for a while and you've been help you, you know, started off by helping yourself and then realizing that, that to help yourself, you help other people. You've had these experiences. And I'm just wondering, have you had a moment where you realized like like, this was, is this was really your path and that you could really understand that this was something you were meant to do? Um, I, yeah, I kind of had an interesting, um, well, I think the first thing is uh, when I encountered compassion, um, it was sort of by um, happenstance. Like it okay. was just sort of like, I, I don't even know how I encountered it. Mm-hmm. Um, and it really, it felt like a, a gut thing. Like, I'm like, oh, this is, this is supposed to be what I'm doing. Um, but I really thought it was going to look very different. So I really, I was working in, in the field of child welfare at the time. And so I thought, oh, my, maybe my life purpose is to bring this sort of thing love and compassion into the child welfare system kept coming up with lots of roadblocks and so on Mm -hmm. um and then I ended up meeting someone who had an extraordinary story of compassion and that sort of led to the podcast I I didn't even know what podcasting was like I didn't know and it was just my interaction with this person who actually does uh compassion in the prison system 
Um, and it was her story that led me to say, this story has to be heard. And so that led to the podcast. Um, and then just the series of like unexpected circumstances that led to uh, my doing this work currently. Um, and it feels so, it feels like it just feels right. It just, it, it, I have so much passion and joy in my life. Mm-hmm. I wake up excited to to be doing what I'm doing. I feel more abundant and, and, and more um, and more motivated than I've ever felt. So when you're on your path, you just know it. It just feels like it's the right thing. You're excited about all the things you do and the things that you're not super excited about. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas when I was going to my quote unquote job at the very end, it felt like I was dragging myself into Monday. It felt like it just didn't align. I felt like I didn't really fit and that I was trying to fit myself into a box. Um, whereas I feel, I feel free to create uh-huh, currently. Uh-huh. And so, so yeah, it's, it's been a, a, a heart journey um, because what I thought, what my mind told me that it was going to look like, it's not what it's looking like at all. Like it's, it's, yeah. there's, things that I never thought that I would be doing, I'm doing. Um, and so I'm just kind of opening myself to source universe, God to guide me. So. Isn't it amazing how life will hand us things or bring us to places that we just never, you know, it's some so often like it's, I always think it's good to have a plan, but then it's good to understand that that's like a rough outline to guide you and that something else is probably going to come along that could be so much better and bigger and more rewarding than anything that was on our plan. You know, yeah. especially when I was younger, my plan, to be honest, was all about moving up the ladder and making money. That was my plan. You know, like, I need to make this much money by a certain age, you know, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I don't think I was uncommon. And what you're saying about that, knowing like that drudgery of that dragging yourselves to work. Unfortunately, I think too many people have that experience of, Oh, it's Monday. I mean, you see it in social media and memes and jokes and things about, oh, it's Monday again. And if our work was aligned, we wouldn't dread Monday. Right? We would be we would be get sprinting up on Monday morning and saying, I get to do what I love. Yes. I get to to live my life of joy. I get to to do something that I'm excited about. But we've bought into that belief, right? We've bought into that belief that our goals, our life is about making money and climbing up the corporate ladder and, and going to a job. And and see, these are just beliefs like anything else. And so I think now more than ever, we're realizing that we get to take the reins of our lives. We're taking our power back. And you see it in lots of different ways that people are starting to be really dissatisfied with the systems we have. Um, and starting to really realize, okay, so what do I want to create now that these mm-hmm. systems are? <laughs> then I don't want these systems. What do I want instead? Exactly. Exactly. Some tips for the people who are listening, who are still at that place, unfortunately, where the drudgery of it all, do you have a couple of tips for, to help them that the ones that are like, uh, I have to go to work tomorrow. Yeah. Um, I would say, uh, be willing. To, so at willingness begin like sort of cracks the door open to anything. Mm-hmm. Be willing to believe that you can live your dream. Uh, be willing to ask your heart what it would rather be doing now or be willing to ask yourself what do you want to do what's your passion what do you do I've asked so many people and sometimes people have no idea they they have no clue and it's because they weren't allowed maybe as children to 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 do the things that bring them joy especially if they had really restrictive parents they may not even know how to answer that because if they had parents that criticized them for doing things that they love to do or their joy, they're going to withdraw and not want to be criticized for wanting to be, you know, an airplane pilot or wanting to be an artist or something that maybe didn't uh, meet their parents or or their, their teacher's expectations. Mm -hmm. And so just being willing to believe that you can live your dreams, being willing to tap into your heart and say, Hey, what's the biggest, boldest dream that we could have for ourselves. That doesn't mean you have to quit your job. Doesn't mean you don't have to do the things you have to do or pay your bills or anything like that. Mm-hmm. It's just you being open to how if if we were going to do this, maybe theoretically, what could that look like? How could that be open? Could is this something that I could do 
you know, on the side or just start even little tiny, tiny. I have a friend who's starting a new business and she's mm -hmm. like, you know, first of all, she had to say yes to the universe. And so she just said yes. And things are just coming at her, which is amazing. Um, and she's like, you know what? I just want to start teeny tiny to see if this is something I would love or even start. So you don't, people always tell you, oh, you got to make a million dollars and you got to start off within the five. You don't just start from a place that you love to see if you're really going to love it. Take a step forward. You don't have to go all the way to the end, as people always say. So mm -hmm. I think if you manage it in, in small bites, you may be able to on the path before you know it, one step at a time, you're living your dream. I think you're right. I, that's so helpful. Thank you so much. How do you keep your spiritual reserves, you know, strong and full so that you are able to continue to help us? Yeah, to me to stay on the boat, you mean? Yes. How do you stay on the boat? Yeah. yeah. I I meditate. I, okay. I do a meditation. I do a Qigong practice as well. But I just wanted to put a proviso. Different things work for different people. So I do believe that sort of within our hearts, there is like a seed of things that are really our passions and things that really work well for us. Mm -hmm. And the, our purpose is to water that seed and allow it to come to fruition. I mean, the seed has within it everything that it needs to make a tree. And so I think we're the same. I think we just have to water that with love and compassion and curiosity and creativity and allow that seed to sprout. So Find whatever works for you that helps you stay on the boat. For me, it's Qigong, it's meditation, it's checking in. I think when I'm struggling the most, I will put an alarm every hour to check in on myself. Oh, that's so to, smart. To say, okay, keep yourself, are you, are you keeping the high vibration and energy? Are you still staying or are you sinking into the stress are you are you getting caught in the story are you getting and so and what happens over time is that before even the alarm goes off you will um you will notice and you mm -hmm. will actually stay in that space um and that comes from regan hellier um and so that so keeping that that energy up and keeping that awareness of myself keeps me grounded Mm -hmm. Does that mean that I don't get, of course, like everyone just has days where they're triggered or they just can't do it. Sure. In those moments, in those moments, I meet myself with curiosity and non-judgment and say, hey, what's going on, Giselle? What's happening for you? Okay, this is happening for me. Okay, I need to take a moment for myself and give some boundaries, especially with my children because they okay, can be fair. ask, 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 ask. Um, and say, okay, I need to regroup for myself so that I can show up as the best version of myself. And so that's what I do for myself to help mm -hmm. myself. I also love gardening and being outside. Okay. Uh, but again, people need to find what really resonates for themselves. Um, and, and like my daughter, she just doesn't do meditation. She doesn't okay. do that. But when she is in her art, she's fully in and she's in the mindfulness moment. Or when she's in her garden, she's in full joy. And so I think people need to find what the, but it's really is about asking ourselves and taking that time and saying, okay, what would bring me the greatest joy or what would help me in this moment when I'm struggling? That's beautiful. Thank you. Are there any other tips that you would like to leave us with or something that you wanted me to ask you that I didn't, that you'd like to address? This is that, this is that moment to make sure. Yeah. No, um, I think the only thing that I want to mention is that it's our birthright to live our dreams. It's our birthright to be abundant and healthy and, and, and all of those things. Um, and every time that somebody does that and steps up into their own power, that person becomes the beacon for someone else to be able to know that they can do it. And that's how we're walking ourselves all the way back, like to, to, to home, right? Like to, yeah. our, to our best selves. And so don't be afraid to be willing to take a scary step or to believe that you can live your dreams. You don't have to get stuck at a tenant job. You don't have to, in my experience, honestly, when I took a step in faith, things came at me that I didn't even know. Like the universe sort of provided for me. I'm not saying that you need to take that step because you need to meet yourself where you're at, mm -hmm. but just know that you are worthy to live all your dreams. And so just be willing. Beautiful. And you hit upon one of my favorite sayings too, expressions, which is we're all just walking each other home. Yeah, I, I do feel home. that way. And I do feel that way that 
by extinguishing your own light. Sometimes we dim our light because we think I'm going to make somebody uncomfortable or I was told to or whatever. And that's such a, we've done ourselves such a disservice. The more brightly you shine, the more other people go, ooh, I want what they're having. And then you show yourself as a potential for someone else. I've been inspired by so many people. I've also inspired others. You've inspired people. You've been inspired by others. This is how we get through. This is how we actually get to live our best lives. Absolutely. So where can people find you? Yeah, if you go to my website, www.mytreecenter, it's M-A-I-T-R-I-C-E-N-T-R-E.com. You will find our podcast there. There's also some blogs. Uh, My book is there. Um, And right now I'm in the middle of writing uh, my second book. I'll also post my TEDx talk there uh, when it's available. I'm just waiting for the edits. Perfect. I can't thank you enough. I know this is so helpful to everyone. And thank you so much for sharing your time, your brain space, your wisdom, and your compassion with us. I've got books for you, starting with Carpooling with Death, How Living with Death Will Make You Stronger, Wiser, and Fearless, the book that got me going and helped me to discuss going through the death of my loved ones, followed by Sitting with Death, Buddhist insights to help you face your fears and live a peaceful life based on season one of the Death Dhamma podcast, and just recently, Enlightenment Unleashed, how your pet can lead you to spiritual transformation, because during our lifetime, we may see the rising and ceasing of many pets, and we love them like they are our family. Find these on amazon.com or come see me at margaretmaloney.com. You've been listening to the Death Dhamma podcast with your host, Margaret Maloney. Thank you so much for being here. Come find me on margaretmaloney.com, M-A-R-G-A-R-E-T-M-E-L-O-N-I.com. And until we meet again, may you be well, may you be happy, may you be at ease, and may you be free from suffering. Bye for now.